Today's scripture is from the book of Exodus, the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Amen. Thank you, Keith. So last week in our series, we learned about the Gospel of Pooh. Now, Winnie the Pooh is known to be a bear with a very little brain. Well, this week, I want to introduce you to Hey Hey, who is a chicken with absolutely no brain. Hey, hey provides a lot of comic relief in this story. <laughs> Moana is the daughter of the chief at the island of Montanui. It's a beautiful island with lots of fish and coconuts. Everybody has a purpose on that island. But the chief has imposed one rule. Never go beyond the reef. It's too dangerous. All is well on the island until it isn't. The fish are disappearing. The coconuts are rotten. And as you heard in the song, Moana has always felt called by the sea. But she doesn't know why. Her grandmother has encouraged her to pursue this call even though her father, her son, has forbidden it. And like Moses, Mo Moana received a very distinct call. But hers is from the sea, which her grandmother actually witnesses. And the grandma sings, You are your father's daughter, stubbornness and pride. Mind what he says, but remember, you may hear a voice inside. And if the voice starts to whisper to follow the furthest star, Moana, that voice inside is who you are. And she eventually tells Moana what she must do to save her people. It just so happened that the heart of the mother island creator God, Tafiti, who you heard about in Fresh Word, had the power to create life. But her heart was stolen by a misguided demigod with an identity crisis named Maui. Now, Maui actually wanted to earn the approval of the people 
by ultimately giving them the heart so they could have the power to create life. But first, he gave them islands and coconuts and boats and other good things. But without her heart, Tafiti began to crumble and give birth to a fiery volcano god named Taka. The other gods were so upset that they stripped Maui of his magic fish hook. That fish hook allowed him to be a shapeshifter. They took away the heart, threw it into the ocean, and banished him to a desert island for a thousand years. But before she died, Grandma had shown Moana the cave where the ocean-worthy boats, ancestral boats, were stored. And she told Moana on her deathbed to go beyond the reef to save her people. And Moana, though, has to find Maui and convince him to help her to return the heart to Tafiti. Now, when we first meet Maui, Moana is shipwrecked on an island. She really doesn't know how to sail. So she ends up shipwrecked on an island. And Maui, who is eager to get off the island, is thrilled to get a boat. He doesn't have his fish hook. He can't go anywhere. And he finds Moana. And he thinks she's come for his autograph because he is that impressive. So when they first meet, Moana, thinking that, uh, Ma uh, sorry, Maui, thinking that Moana has thanked him for his autograph, says, you're welcome. And Jaime and Mark are going to sing us this song. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I see what's happening here. You're face to face with greatness and it's strange. You don't even know how you feel. It's adorable. Well, it's nice to see that humans never change. Open your eyes, let's begin. Yes, it's really me, it's Maui. Breathe it in. I know it's a lot, the hair, the bud. When you're staring at a demigod, what can I say except you're welcome? For the tides, the sun, the sky. Hey, it's okay, it's okay, you're welcome. I'm just an ordinary demigod. Hey, what has two thumbs and pulled up the sky? When you were waddling yay high, this guy. When the nights get cold, who stole you fire from down below? You're looking at him, yo. Oh, also I lassoed the sun. You're welcome to stretch your days and bring you fun. Also I harness the breeze. You're welcome to fill your sails and shake your trees. So what can I say except you're welcome For the islands I pulled from the sea There's no need to pray, it's okay, you're welcome ha, I guess it's just my way of being me You're welcome, you're welcome Well, come to think of it Kids, honestly, I could go on and on. I could explain every natural phenomenon. The tide, the grass, the ground, all that was Maui just messing around. That killed an eel, I buried its guts. Sprouted a tree, now you got coconuts. What's the lesson? What is the takeaway? Don't mess with Maui when he's on the breakaway. And the tapestry here on my skin is a map of the victories I've won. Look where I've been, I make everything happen. Look at that mean mini Maui just tippity tapping. Ha, 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 ha. Hey, hey! Well, anyway, let me say you're welcome for the.
the wonderful world that you know. Hey, it's okay, it's okay, you're welcome. Well, come to think of it, I gotta go. Hey, it's your day to say you're welcome. Cause I'm gonna need that boat. I'm sailing away, away, you're welcome. Cause now we can't do everything but float. You're welcome, you're welcome. And thank you. Well, as you can see, Maui is the trickster character who has to learn what he really cares about and what he's willing to sacrifice. But Moana, uh, he actually um, locks Moana in a cave and confiscates her boat. But Moana escapes the cave and with the help of the ocean catches up with Maui, who has sailed away with Hei Hei. And as with all hero quests, they confront several obstacles on their way to replace the heart. They have to fight the Kakamora, a ship populated by pirate coconuts. Then they have to find Maui's fish hook, so he's able to shift his shape in order to combat the, vi uh, the fiery volcano god. And Maui figures the giant crab Tamatoa has it, so they have to go to the realm of the monsters. Well, they do that and receive the, uh, retrieve the fish hook and Maui has to learn to use it again. I mean, after all, it's been a thousand years. And this provides some comic relief because things don't go the way they should. And his warrior persona, which is a huge hawk, seems impossible for him to accomplish. Now, Moana tries to motivate Maui to help her by appealing to his pride and reputation. She reminds him that what he desires most is to be a hero. But Currently, he's no one's hero. He's just the guy who stole the heart. It works. Maui eventually begins to see himself more clearly as he teaches her to sail and helps her realize that her voyaging ancestry, which had been completely lost because they couldn't go beyond the reef, is also known as wayfinding. Knowing where you are by where you've been wayfinding. Through this transformation of his character and appreciating the strength of Moana, because she is determined to save her people, Maui is finally able to shift into the warrior hawk shape and confront the vol volcano god, Taka. And he puts up a strong fight. His fish, fish hook is actually damaged in the battle, though. And one more strike, and it will be broken, and he will lose his magical powers. And he tells Moana, without my fish hook, I am nothing. Yeah, Moana doesn't buy it. She says, no, that's not true. But Maui just feels he cannot continue, and out of fear, he leaves Moana. Now, this forces the climactic decision that Moana has to make. Can she go on? Her grandmother, who has recently departed, appears to her on the boat. As Moana is telling the ocean, I'm so sorry, you're going to have to find someone else, and throws the heart into the ocean. But at this point in the story, Moana has a stronger sense of who she is. And we're going to witness this encounter between Grandma and Moana I know a girl from an island She stands apart from the crowd She loves her sea and her people She makes her whole family 
proud. Sometimes the world seems against you. The journey may leave a scar. But scars can heal and reveal just where you are. The people you love will change you. The things you have learned will guide you. And nothing on earth can silence the quiet voice still inside you. And when the voice starts to whisper, Moana, you've come so far. Moana, listen, do you know who you are? Who am I? I am the girl who loves my island and the girl who loves the sea. It calls me. I am the daughter of the village chief. We are descended from voyagers who found their way across the world. They call me. I have delivered us to where we are. I have journeyed farther. I am everything I've learned and more. It still calls me. The call isn't there, it's inside me. It's like the tide, always falling and rising. I will care. So Moana had already thrown Tafiti's heart back into the ocean, but she can't bring herself to give up on the quest. She dives in to get the heart and heads back to the island of the volcano god by herself. And Taka is spewing fire and rocks at her. She realizes that to get to Tafiti, the god that she needs to take the heart back to, she will have to get past Taka into the lagoon that will take her to Tafiti's island. Now Moana realizes that Taka cannot leave the island to step into the water because it would put out her fire. And she uses that knowledge to encourage Taka to throw many fiery rocks at her, thereby creating a smoke screen when they hit the water which enables her to slip into the passage undetected. She almost makes it to the far side of the lagoon before Taka sees her. And then Maui reappears as the warrior hawk to distract Taka as Moana points the heart at the spiral on Taka's chest. Taka strikes again and completely destroys Maui's fish hook this time. Then a Moses moment appears. The seas part, and Taka, who is on the island on the other side of the lagoon uh, from where Moana is, starts to leave the island on dry ground and crawl fiery you know, molten lava spewing fire toward Moana. Moana looks directly at her. And when, when Taka gets close enough, she reaches out and touches her. And by that time, Taka, the fiery volcano god, 
has become molten lava and is cool to the touch. Moana sings, I have crossed the horizon to find you. I know your name. They have not stolen the heart from inside you. They have stolen the heart from inside you. But this does not define you. This is not who you are. You know who you are. Moana replaces the heart in the empty place in her chest. And immediately, rebirth takes place all around. Maui apologizes sincerely to Tafiti for having stole her heart and is rewarded with a new fish hook. Maui says, hook or no hook, I am Maui. Moana has fulfilled her request, her request to restore the island for her people and to keep, help them reclaim their ancestral identity as voyagers, wayfarers, wayfinders. I love that term, wayfinders. So there are so many spiritual lessons in this story, from heeding your call, to finding your true identity, to listening to your elders, to overcoming obstacles, and there are more. The Moses story, Keith read, illustrates receiving a call by God to do something well outside Moses' comfort zone. So how do we recognize a call from God? Well, in Moana's and Moses' case, the calls are very overt and highly unusual. But to receive the call, even Moses had to turn and look at the burning bush and wonder why it wasn't consumed. And Moana needed the encouragement of her grandmother to go against the wishes of her father. Her father was a good man. He cared for his people. And the one time he had ventured out beyond the reef, tragedy occurred. So that's why he doubled down on that rule, to protect his people. Sometimes a call from God can come as a gentle nudge. But sometimes we are called into service as the result of an experience we had not bargained for. But with any quest for good, there are obstacles along the way that will try to impede our progress and our good intentions. And my experience has taught me that if God calls me to embark on a journey, I will not be abandoned along the way as long as I keep listening for direction. In the fall of my senior year in college, a girlfriend of mine suggested that we should go to England and work at a nursing home the fall after we graduated. And I had no plans. I didn't know what I was gonna to do tomorrow. So that sounded like a good adventure. We started our planning about nine months ahead of time. We had to contact the nursing home, get passports, work permits, and save money. And while I was praying about all those activities, I found a quote from Mary Baker Eddy who is a 19th century theologian that I often read. And the quote is, love, and that means divine love, another name for God, inspires, illumines, designates, and leads the way. And I really like that quote because it kind of laid out a progressive process of how things might develop over that year. And my friend and I felt inspired uh, by the idea of going to uh, be of selfless service somewhere in a new community. We were going to be on the housekeeping staff. So we listened for how our steps would be illuminated, designate, and how God would lead us through. So we went about the process of applying for the job, a work permit, passports, and so on. And some things went smoothly and some not so much. The job offers and the passports were obtained by the end of the school year, but my work permit took longer. I ended up working in Boston for that summer, and my boyfriend flew out at the end of the summer and we drove to Florida to visit my parents. And while we were there, I went to my home church, and I saw a woman that I had known for many years who was an experienced traveler. I enjoyed talking with her and asking her questions about traveling and so on. 
And she ended by our conversation by saying, I wish you could put me in your suitcase and take me with you. And while I was in Florida, my boyfriend became my fiance, now my husband. And my mother was thrilled <laughs> because she knew I'd be coming back. So we drove uh, together to college near St. Louis so he could finish his senior year and I could take my plane from Chicago to go to London. The biggest challenge at that point, though, was that my work permit hadn't had not arrived at the college. And I had been told, do not come without a work permit. So I went back to the quote. If God, divine love, was leading the way, I would know what steps I needed to take. And I could rest in that. The permit arrived the day before I was supposed to leave. And before I knew it, I was on my way, on an airplane to London. I'd never been out of the country before. The plan was for my friend, who had already gotten there, to meet me at Heathrow Airport in London. And I was completely dependent on her because I had no idea where I was going. So I went through customs in London and entered into an extremely crowded airport. I didn't find my friend. But I was not afraid, since I felt I was on a divine adventure. I had an abiding conviction that I would be taken care of in a way I would understand. I remember her telling me that I could exchange my dollars for the local currency at the airport. So I went over to the exchange window and turned my $50. Yes, I traveled to London on, with $50 in my pocket. My mom didn't know. <laughs> so as I received my about 25 pounds, I stepped back from the window and was examining this play money I had in my hand. I looked up, and standing about 18 inches from me in the Heathrow Airport was my friend from my home church in Florida. Yeah, yeah. We saw each other at the same time. Without skipping a beat, she said she and her husband had flown in from Miami that morning, Chicago. Miami, Heathrow Airport. Her husband was getting a car. She said they would be happy to drop me off at that nursing home. My friend had arrived by that time, so she knew what was going on. So I always say that divine love inspired, illumined, designated, the, led, led the way, and dropped me off at the doorstep. The other aspect of that movie that I want to revisit is how Moana faced head-on the evil that threatened her. She outsmarted the angry God by using that God's aggression against her. When she arrived at Tefiti's island, she realized Tefiti was not there and that the darkness of Taka had enveloped the creator God with the missing heart. Moana has the courage to face the angry God and meet her face to face, all the while declaring that this angry being did not really define who that inner being truly was. As soon as the heart was in place, life was restored. The evil facade was seen through, and the heart of goodness and life was back where it belonged. In the presence of the heart of good, the evil could not remain. Now that sounds a little simplistic when thinking of the evil we face in the world today. But looking at evil directly and naming it or exposing it for what it is can go a long way toward dealing with it and removing fear of it. And finally, at the end, Moana says, thank you to Maui for his help. And Maui says, you're welcome.
But this time, he really means it. Amen.